Hey, Retcon Raider here. Now, we've already spent a decent amount of time talking about the version of Hoover Dam that was going to appear in Fallout Van Buren. Today, we'll be wrapping up our analysis of design document number 12 by taking a look at the quest content that was planned for this location. Once again, we have quite a bit of ground to cover, so let's get started. The biggest quest planned for Hoover Dam involved resolving the conflict between the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel. The player could only get this quest by talking to Governor Joseph Dodge, but they wouldn't be allowed to meet with him when they first arrived at Hoover Dam. Instead, the player would have to build up a reputation around town until someone was willing to set up a meeting with the governor. The easiest way to accomplish this was if the player had a high mechanic skill. If they did, then they just needed to meet with Pierre Lapoubelle, a former Brotherhood scribe who was now working as an engineer for the followers of the Apocalypse. Pierre would explain that the water from Lake Mead was horribly contaminated, and that the current filtration system could make the water suitable for irrigation, but not for drinking. He would then give the player a quest to find a way to improve the town's water filtration system. The player could find an appropriate schematic at the desalination plant in Jericho. If they then delivered this schematic to Pierre, the quest would be completed and the player would be rewarded with some experience points, reputation, and a basic repair tool. However, if the player actually had sufficient mechanical skill to personally upgrade the filtration system, then not only would they gain greater rewards, but they would also earn the right to meet with the governor. Unfortunately, if the player wasn't some sort of tech savant, then they were going to have to get their hands dirty by wading into the messy business rivalry between two local caravan companies. Now, if you watched my previous videos about this location, then you know that the Crimson Caravan Company was actively working against the town's best interests. They were led by Alice McLafferty, an unrepentant opportunist who was deliberately playing the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel against each other. By providing supplies to both sides, she was raking in massive profits, and her secret alliance with the Circle of Steel also allowed her to actively harm her closest competitors at the Threesome Caravan Company. Her intent was to drag out the conflict until Governor Dodge had been forced out of office, at which point she would betray the Circle of Steel and destroy Max and Bunker. She hoped that this would effectively end the war and secure her place as the new governor of Hoover Dam. It was up to the player to first discover McLafferty's plot and then to decide exactly what, if anything, they wanted to do about it. There were several ways for the player to first be introduced to this plot. The easiest method was to simply walk into one of the caravan companies and ask for a job, but the player could also receive appropriate plot hooks by visiting the local bars. If the player visited the bar up on the rim, then its proprietor, Pablo Riviera, would give the player a minor quest to get him some booze. If the player instead visited the bar in the downtown area, then Dusty Hart would give the player a minor quest to help collect outstanding tabs from some of her deadbeat customers. In either case, completing the associated quest would earn the player a reference to the Threesome Caravan Company or the Crimson Caravan Company, respectively. Regardless of how the player ended up working for one of the caravan companies, the next stage of the quest was generally the same. The player would need to earn the trust of their new employer by successfully completing one or more basic caravan escort quests. These quests were intended to be similar to the caravan quests featured in Fallout 2, and would also provide the player with a potentially infinite source of loot and experience points, at the cost of travel time. If the player decided to work for the Crimson Caravan Company, then they would need to complete at least three caravan escort quests to gain McLafferty's trust. She would then give the player a special quest to help her frame the Threesome Caravan Company as being allies of the Brotherhood, forcing Governor Dodge to put them out of business for good. Assuming the player accepted the quest, they would need to plant an incriminating note in Enzo Giordano's desk. They would then need to plant a bomb outside of Governor Dodge's office, and upon reporting back to McLafferty, she would set the bomb off. While it would kill some of the other NPCs, Dodge would survive the blast, and McLafferty would subsequently point him towards the Giordano brothers. Major Fleming would lead a raid on the Threesome Caravan Company and discover the incriminating note, prompting a gunfight as the Giordano brothers tried to shoot their way to safety. Once the dust had settled, the brothers would be dead, and the Threesome Caravan Company would be no more. McLafferty would lavishly reward the player with 2,000 caps and a referral to meet with Governor Dodge. 
Things get a bit fuzzier here, but the document also seems to imply that McLafferty would then allow the player to take on more lucrative caravan escort missions to Max and Bunker. Design document number 10 also heavily implies that McLafferty could potentially offer the player a quest to sabotage the Jericho desalination plant. If the player instead decided to work for the Threesome Caravan Company, then things would play out somewhat differently. Once the player had completed a few basic caravan escort missions, Enzo Giordano would then give the player a special quest. He would ask the player to infiltrate the Crimson Caravan Company in hopes of finding evidence proving that they were up to no good. If the player agreed to Enzo's request, then the Giordano brothers would stage a falling out, pretending that the player had somehow betrayed them. McLafferty would be intrigued, offering the player a job soon afterwards and potentially giving them an opportunity to find the evidence they were looking for. This would come in the form of McLafferty's private ledger, which included a full record of her dealings with Devon Hill. The player would either need to steal this from McLafferty's desk, or they would have to travel to Max and Bunker and steal an identical copy of the ledger that was carried by Devon Hill. Once the player had a copy of the ledger, they could deliver it to Major Fleming, and he would promptly raid the Crimson Caravan Company. A gunfight would ensue, and in the end, McLafferty would be dead, and the Crimson Caravan Company would be shut down. The player would again receive a reward of 2,000 caps, as well as the right to meet with Governor Dodge. If the player actually lacked the appropriate stealth skills to steal the ledger, then they could still take it by force. This would lead to a fairly difficult fight, and Major Fleming would initially try to arrest them for murdering Alice McLafferty, but once the player handed over the ledger, they would instead be lauded as a hero. The caravan quest would be resolved, and they would still be allowed to meet with Governor Dodge. More opportunistic players could instead use the ledger to blackmail McLafferty, with the exact results of the blackmail depending on the player's persuasion skill. If their skill was high enough, then they would receive a hefty 10,000 caps, with a warning to never mention the ledger again. If the player's persuasion skill wasn't high enough, they would still receive a respectable 5,000 caps, but McLafferty would also tell them they had 24 hours to get out of town. After that point, the Crimson Caravan Company would attack the player on sight. While blackmailing McLafferty could earn the player a hefty stack of caps, it would also prevent them from being able to complete the quest and meet with Governor Dodge. The player could work around this by obtaining the second ledger, or by somehow taking the original ledger away from McLafferty. In either case, they could then complete the quest by handing the ledger over to Major Fleming so they could meet with Governor Dodge and move on to the next main quest. Once the player was allowed to meet with Dodge, they would gain access to the town's most prominent quest, brokering peace between Hoover Dam and Max and Bunker. After years of fighting, both sides were eager for peace, but they just weren't sure how to go about ending the conflict. The biggest obstacle was posed by the Circle of Steel, who were regularly attacking caravans and outposts in the Brotherhood's name. We talked about the Circle back in the Max and Bunker video, so we'll keep this short. The player could basically resolve the quest by confronting Devon Hill at Max and Bunker and exposing the Circle's plot. Once the Circle was out of the way, they could convince Governor Dodge and Elder Brixley to finally begin negotiating a ceasefire. If diplomacy wasn't the player's strong suit, they could also resolve the conflict by simply tracking down Max and Bunker and killing everyone inside. This wasn't exactly an ideal solution, but it would earn the player a lot of extra loot and combat experience. Of course, it also wouldn't resolve the issue of the caravan attacks, and the player would still end up needing to find and destroy the Circle of Steel. Either way, once the conflict had been resolved, the quest would be concluded and the player would receive significant rewards. Aside from caps and experience points, they would also enjoy reduced prices at all of the local stores, free access to the fancy PC home on the rim, and a weapon of their choice from the NCR Armory. Several of the older design documents also make reference to another major quest, which would have required the player to resolve a conflict between Hoover Dam and the Mormon-run town of New Canaan. This is most prominently described in the New Canaan and Burham Springs design documents, which describe how the player could either take sides in the conflict or work towards brokering a truce. Unfortunately, since New Canaan was cut from the game early in development, it's probably safe to assume that all of the related quest content was meant to be cut as well. 
Despite this, it's possible that at least some of the related quests may have remained mostly intact. For example, design document number 11 describes how Governor Dodge had a vested interest in getting the old coal mine operational again. This is somewhat echoed in the Hoover Dam document, so it seems very likely that the associated quest would have still been included in the final game, albeit with all references to New Canaan removed. Beyond that, Hoover Dam also had several smaller side quests to offer, many of which revolved around improving the town or otherwise helping its inhabitants. For example, Dodge would express concern about the settlement's power output. Hoover Dam's power generators were over two centuries old, so they weren't performing nearly as efficiently as they could be. Players with appropriate mechanical and scientific skills could recalibrate the generators to perform better, earning them some quick experience points and reputation. Dodge would also explain that due to the ongoing hostilities, the city councilmen were refusing to come to any meetings. This would be easy to resolve if the player had already brokered a truce with the Brotherhood, but otherwise, the player could use the deception skill to essentially trick the councilman into thinking it was safe to continue meeting at City Hall. Similarly, Candace Morris, the head of the local followers of the Apocalypse, wanted to reopen the school on the rim. Parents had all pulled their kids out of class because of the dangers posed by the ongoing war, but once the war was over, the player would be able to easily complete this quest. Once classes had started back up, the player could earn even more rewards by helping Candace teach a class on Wasteland Survival. This was another very basic quest, with the player's intelligence and charisma determining both their level of success as well as the size of their reward. In addition, Candace was intended to act as a passive quest character, rewarding the player in exchange for various pieces of Wasteland lore or pre-war history. The document lists a few examples of what she would pay for, such as information about the bomb satellites or the Twin Mothers tribe, but of course, this list is far from conclusive. Less scrupulous players could even use the deception skill to simply make up stories, earning some extra caps at Candace's expense. The downtown area also had its own particularly ambitious quest chain, which revolved around helping Farmer Dave expand the settlement's hydroponic farms. Farmer Dave would propose clearing out the scum pits so the settlers could construct additional hydroponic bays, which would not only lead the player through multiple smaller quests, but would also ultimately lead them to sub-level C1. The first obstacle was posed by the Trogs who lived in the baseline, the utility tunnels that separated the scum pits from the downtown area. If the player wanted to pass through Trog territory, then they were going to need to use stealth, violence, or diplomacy. Assuming the player opted to use diplomacy, then they would be able to learn that the Trog's leader, Billy Bob, was becoming increasingly concerned with his daughter's behavior. Apparently, she was spending an awful lot of time at Dusty's bar. If the player chose to investigate, then they would quickly discover that Mary Jo wasn't just hanging out at the bar, she was actually working in the attached brothel. If the player could prove this to Billy Bob, then the Trogs would go on a rampage. A war would break out between the Trogs and the Settlers, ultimately wiping out the Trogs, but also destroying the hydroponic farms in the process. The player would now have access to the lower levels, but they would no longer be able to complete the farm questline. A more subtle means of resolving this conflict was to simply bribe Dusty into kicking Mary Jo out of her bar. Mary Jo would be upset, but her father would be happy, and the impending crisis would be averted. More importantly, the player would be welcome in Trog territory. A much more roundabout solution was to instead get Mary Jo pregnant. If the player was running a male character and they decided to uh, spend some time with Mary Jo, there was a 20% chance per encounter that Mary Jo would become pregnant. There would be no immediate effects, but a few months later, Billy Bob would firmly request the player's presence, insisting that they do the honorable thing and marry his daughter. If the player agreed, then everything would work out just fine. Billy Bob wouldn't necessarily be happy with the situation, but he would still allow the player to enter Trog territory. If the player refused, then they would need a sufficiently high persuasion skill to defuse the situation, otherwise violence would ensue. In that case, the player would be forced to kill the majority of the Trogs, and Mary Jo would go back to working at Dusty's bar, but on the bright side, the player would finally be able to reach the scum pits. Once the player had access to the scum pits, things would become a lot more straightforward. 
This area was heavily populated with hazards in the form of toxic sludge and mutant critters. It was essentially a glorified combat quest, requiring the player to wipe out all of the albino ants, giant rats, and mutant leeches. Once all of this had been completed, Farmer Dave would begin assessing the area for construction, leading to one last quest. Although the town now had more space for farms, they didn't actually have the supplies they needed to start building them. The player would need to travel to the ruins of Denver and work out a trade deal with Porter, the leader of the NCR Salvagers. Once all of this had been accomplished, Farmer Dave would finally begin construction on the new hydroponic farms. Over the next 12 months of in-game time, the scum pits would slowly change from a toxic nightmare into a fully functional underground farm. The player would, of course, be rewarded for their efforts, but more importantly, clearing out the scum pits would give them a decent amount of loot and also potentially give them access to sub-level 1C. Upon discovering an electronically locked hatch in the albino ant nest, they would acquire a new quest, instructing them to access and explore this mysterious new sublevel. Again, this was a fairly straightforward challenge. The player would first need to hack or blast their way through the hatch, and then they would need to exterminate the FEV mutants that were still infesting the old lab. Once the mutants had been cleared out, the player would gain access to valuable pre-war equipment, including parts that they could use to build a Chinese stealth suit. They would also gain access to a functional pre-war computer, which contained information about Hoover Dam's secret past. If the player relayed this information back to Candace, they would receive a significant reward. The followers of the Apocalypse would also spend the next few months rebuilding the secret sublevel. Once those repairs were complete, the player would gain access to one of the best science labs in the entire game. Now, that covers all the prominent quests in the Hoover Dam area, but there were still a few other minor tasks that the player could perform around town. For example, I've mentioned it in a couple of my other videos, but shortly after arriving in town, the player would witness a bar fight at Dusty's Desires. A few rowdy patrons would attack Beatrice, the super mutant bouncer, and if the player tried to help her, then she would end up swearing her eternal loyalty to them. It was a very simple and straightforward quest event that would reward the player with a potential recruitable companion. The document also mentions that the developers had plans to implement a few minor police quests. No significant details are given, but the general gist of it is that the player would have been able to work as a local police informant. If the player was more interested in frontier justice, then they could instead visit Bob, the local pawn shop owner who also ran a bounty hunting business on the side. The developers had tentative plans for at least six bounty contracts intended to take the player all over the Colorado area. Each contract required the player to locate and kill a specific target, take their head, and return it to Bob for a 1,000 cap reward. The developers were still actively coming up with potential contracts, and only a few of them were fleshed out to any significant degree. Most of these contracts were intended to present the player with potential complications, forcing the player to use caution lest they should accidentally destroy their reputation with some of the game's other factions. For players who preferred to work on the wrong side of the law, the final prominent quest planned for the Hoover Dam area involved distributing a dangerously addictive new chem called Smooch. This chem was being manufactured by one of the ghoul scientists at the reservation, and we'll spend some more time talking about it in a future video. Suffice to say, if the player decided to distribute the chem in the Hoover Dam area, then the high addiction rate would slowly but steadily start causing problems. This was intended to be a quest that would force the player to choose between short-term reward versus long-term damage, and if the situation wasn't resolved before the end of the game, then Hoover Dam would automatically end up being destroyed. Once the chem had been introduced into the area, the only way to undo some of the damage was to craft an appropriate antitoxin, or if the player lacked the appropriate medical skills, they could get Dr. Polovich to do it for them. Oh, and I suppose there is one other notable quest event that's worth mentioning. I briefly touched on this in the last video, but the developers wanted to include a special easter egg just for particularly destructive players. If the player snuck into the damaged area of the rim, they could use C4 to cause the entire dam to collapse. This would end up destroying the entire settlement and would almost certainly end up killing the player in the process, but they would be rewarded with a special endgame cinematic. Ultimately, all of these quests and events would funnel into a series of six potential endings, 
Two of these endings simply involve destroying the dam, either with the aforementioned secret ending or by targeting the settlement with nuclear missiles. In either case, no one would survive. If the player brokered peace between the Brotherhood and Hoover Dam, then the settlement would thrive, with both factions working together. If the player failed to resolve the conflict, then the Brotherhood would eventually prevail, with Governor Dodge being one of the last casualties of the war. Regardless of how the conflict was resolved, if the player never found a cure for the new plague, then the settlement would still end up struggling. Eventually, the settlement would die off completely. Similarly, if the player began distributing smooch around Hoover Dam and they never created an antitoxin, the addiction would run rampant. Eventually, people would become so apathetic that vital equipment would begin to fail, and the settlement would become a ghost town. So in the end, there was really only one happy ending for Hoover Dam, and a lot of potential bad endings. I guess that's to be expected in a harsh post-apocalyptic setting. That finally brings us to the end of our analysis of design document number 12, which means next time we'll be moving on to design document number 14. That's because, as far as I can tell, there simply isn't a 13th document. But for now, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Fallout Van Buren, you can check out all of the leaked documentation for yourself by visiting the fan-run wikis. Links are in the description. <laughs>